Hey guys, if you've ever wondered if you could run your TV on a battery during a blackout, while camping or in an off-grid setup, in this video I will show you exactly how to do that. First, I will walk you through exactly what you will need and how to choose the right components for your setup and then I will show you step by step how to wire everything up. Before I get into the details, I just want to let you know that I've grouped the parts that you will need into complete kits and added links to them in the description below. Let's get into it! Now, the first thing to note is that most TVs are designed to run on AC power, where AC stands for alternating current. This is the type of power you get from a wall outlet in your home. A battery, on the other hand, supplies DC power, where DC stands for direct current. So basically what this means is that you would not be able to run a TV by somehow directly connecting it to the battery. Instead, we need a component that converts the DC power from the battery into the AC power that the TV can actually use. This component is called an inverter. When it comes to selecting the inverter, there are four key ratings that you need to pay attention to. First, we have the continuous power rating. This is basically the main number to look at. It tells you the maximum amount of electrical power or watts that the inverter can continuously deliver at its output. As I explained in a previous video, TVs don't use a lot of power. So in most cases, a 300 watt inverter will run just about any TV. But to be sure, check the technical specifications label on your TV and look for the wattage rating. This tells you how much power the TV may require to operate. For example, this one needs up to 45 watts. Now, the inverter can be as large as you want as long as its power rating is greater than that of the TV. However, avoid using an inverter that's too oversized as inverters are generally less efficient when running at low capacity. So, unless you plan on powering something else along with your TV, if you want your battery to last as long as possible, stick with a 200 or 300 watt inverter. Next, make sure the input voltage rating of the inverter matches the voltage of your battery. For example, if you're using a 12 volt battery or battery bank, you will need an inverter rated for 12 volt input. If you're using a 24 volt battery bank, then you need a 24 volt inverter. The third rating to look at is the output voltage and frequency. In the US and Canada, most appliances including TVs run on 110 to 120 volts at 60 Hz. In Europe and Australia, appliances typically operate at 220 to 240 volts at 50 Hz. That being said, many modern electronics like TVs and laptops are designed to handle a range of voltages and work with either 50 or 60 Hz. So this specification may not always be a deal breaker. Still, it's worth checking the label on your TV to confirm that the inverter's output voltage and frequency are appropriate. The last thing to look at is the kind of output waveform that the inverter supplies. What you want is a pure sine wave inverter, as these inverters provide an output signal that's similar to what your utility company provides, a clean and smooth signal that won't damage the electronic components inside your TV over time. A cheaper option would be a modified sine wave inverter, but these inverters provide a signal that looks like this, which makes them less efficient and generally not suitable for appliances with sensitive electronics. While it's technically possible to run your TV on a car battery if you have one lying around, keep in mind that car batteries are starter batteries. They're designed to deliver short bursts of high current not to supply power continuously over long periods. So, what you actually need is a deep cycle battery. These are designed to provide a steady amount of power over time, and they come with clear ratings that tell you how much energy they can store and supply. Depending on the size and type, even a small deep cycle battery can run a TV for several hours on a single charge. The cheapest type of deep cycle batteries are lead acid, while the more expensive but more efficient option is lithium. Aside from the price, the main difference between the two comes down to something called depth of discharge or DOD for short. A lead acid battery typically has a recommended DOD of 50%, meaning you should only use half of its total capacity. Discharging it further can significantly shorten its lifespan. A lithium battery, on the other hand, can be discharged all the way to 100% and still last thousands of charge discharge cycles. That's one of the reasons lithium batteries are used in everyday devices like smartphones and laptops. So, for example, the most common ratings for either of these batteries are 12 volt and 100 amp hours. Combined, these ratings give us the energy capacity of the battery. So, for a battery of this size, a lead acid battery at 50% DOD gives you about 600 watt hours of usable energy. A lithium battery at 100% gives you 1200 watt hours. Let's say your TV uses 50 watt hours per hour. 
That means the lead acid battery could run it for around 12 hours before needed in recharge. The lithium battery could run it for up to 24 hours on a single charge. This is of course assuming a perfect scenario where the inverter is 100% efficient, but that's another topic I'll discuss in the next video. By the way, I made a separate video on how to figure out the energy usage of your TV, so if you want to get an estimate, I will leave a link to that in the description below. One more cool thing I wanted to add before moving on is that you can actually combine multiple batteries to increase your overall capacity and get even more runtime. I'll be covering how to do that in an upcoming video, so if that sounds interesting to you, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on it. Now, the wires that connect your inverter to the battery need to be properly sized. And this is done based on two things, the wattage rating of the inverter and the voltage of the battery. For example, if you're using a 300 watt inverter or smaller running on a 12 volt battery, a pair of 10 gauge copper wires will be appropriate. Please note that the sizes provided in the table assume copper wires and short wire runs. If you're using aluminum wires or have wire runs longer than 6 feet or so, you would need to use thicker wires. One last component you will want to add to make the setup safe is either a fuse or a circuit breaker. This ensures that if something goes wrong like a short circuit or an inverter failure, the circuit will break before the wires overheat or catch fire. The size of the fuse or breaker will depend on the maximum current that you want flowing through these wires. For example, if you're using a 300 watt inverter with a 12 volt battery, you would want to use a 30 amp fuse or circuit breaker. The order in which you connect the inverter to the battery doesn't really matter, as long as you're careful not to accidentally short the battery by touching the two poles together. In my case, I started by connecting the wires to the inverter terminals first, then I connected the negative terminal of the battery, followed by the positive. You may have noticed that in this setup, I didn't install any circuit protection. That's because this isn't a permanent setup and I wasn't planning on leaving everything connected overnight or anything like that. But if you're setting this up for regular or long-term use, it's important to include a fuse or circuit breaker in your system as explained before. When you do install one, make sure to place it on the positive wire and as close as possible to the battery terminal. This placement ensures that the entire length of the wire is protected. Now, when you complete the circuit, you might see a small spark. Don't worry, it's just the inrush current from the battery charging the capacitors inside the inverter. It's totally normal and should not be a problem, especially with small inverters like this one. But if you want to be extra cautious, you can briefly tap the wire against the battery terminal before fully connecting it, just to make sure the spark doesn't catch you off guard. Once everything was connected, I turned the inverter on and as you can see it's showing a voltage of 12.8 volts, which means the battery is charged and ready to power my TV. From there, all I had to do was plug in my TV and turn it on. And just like that, the TV is now running on battery power. In the next video, I'll be talking about how to figure out how long your TV can run on one of these batteries. So if that's something you're interested in, make sure to subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification bell so you know as soon as the video goes live. That's it for this one, thanks for watching, if you learned something please give it a thumbs up so more people can find it. And I'll see you in the next one.